Hello everybody and welcome back to the Bayonetta 2 walkthrough. It's time to begin the last kind of batch of extras. We've only got this part, next part, part after and the part after that to go. So what we're going to look at today is the Bewitchments. So you're going to see all of the little artworks and it will tell you how to get all of them. The majority of them are pretty damn simple. And I really like that it's all in here. You've also got the whole thing about crows captured so it tells you the location of all of the Umbran Crows, it's mostly sort of it tells you which chapters they're in and how many there are in each chapter, it doesn't tell you the exact location, which is a bit mean but it's a lot kinder than the first game was which it didn't tell you anything and the fact that there were different Umbran Crows on different difficulties just made that even more evil. And not only that, but we are going to look at the list of Muspelheims, we are going to look at the list of the Angelic Hymns Gold LPs, we are going to look at the Hierarchy of Laguna, we are also going to look at... Let me get it correct. It's... I think it's Lemmergetten's... Yes, Lemmergetten's Guidebook and also bosses, which is what this kind of the next this video and the next video are going to cover. Which is basically going to either involve a lot of me reading or a lot of me rambling whilst you kind of pause, read, or just ignore everything that I'm showing you. <laughs> totally up to you. Because I mean, one of the things that I wish I had done is shown off in this p particular video, or the next one, the descriptions of all of the weapons, but I've covered that in a previous video, as I hope you will have seen. And that means that the only other thing that I haven't shown off is the taunts that Bayonetta, Shan, and Rosa do. Also, what Bolton and Rodan do is their taunts, but oh well. One thing that I do really like about the thing where it says about the Angelic Hymns is that it says, kind of, the name of the composer, so Julius Arnost Villain Physique. It, it, it's, it's really cool. It's annoying because all, pretty much all of the descriptions are near identical. But, oh well. So, William Tell Overture, Giottino Antonio Rossini, The Whole Rash. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Il König Franz Peter Schubert, The Harmonious Blacksmith, George Frederick Handel, Matthias Passion, O Hopp voll Bluten Wunden, Johann Sebastian Bach, Super Mario 64, original music by Nintendo, because they, they, they couldn't name the actual composer, which is a bit sucky. Then we've got the list of the Muspelheims. Now, if you've followed along, then you have seen the locations of all of these, but it's a really nifty little feature that they added to Bayonetta 2, because one of the most frustrating things in the original game was that you couldn't tell where the Alphimes were. Like, your only hint was, I've missed a verse. And so the fact that that tells you as soon as you enter into a chapter, you've got a Muspelheim here. It gives you something to go on. And I believe that I have now ultimately decided that I am not going to read for the next 20 minutes. You can do that yourselves if you can manage to read and listen to my ramblings at the same time. I'd probably recommend pause and read although you will have kind of slightly disjointed experience. I apologise, but <laughs> it's about the only way that I can go about this without driving myself completely insane, which I may already be doing, because it means that I'm going to be talking for like nearly 25 minutes straight, and I don't really have much else to say, other than pointing out some rather fun little things with these angels. Like the fact that I think for the longest time I forgot that the acceptances were called acceptance, because I was focused on the accolades. Which are these guys. <laughs> but, 
the really cool thing about the hierarchy of Laguna is that it does go slightly into all the thing about the spheres and the and the hierarchy. So and it's very much in line with kind of the Orthodox Christian view of the angelic hierarchy, which is really awesome. And there are a number of little kind of touches throughout. Valiance is one of my favourites for this, because it has an absolutely wonderful last paragraph, which I am in love with. <laughs> As you will no doubt see. <laughs> Because Valiance's sword, the Valiantian Blade, is said to have the power to cut into anything in Paradiso or Inferno, and is prophesied to one day assist a team of over a hundred heroes in saving humanity from an invading evil. The wonderful 101 reference ago. Which is just... I, I love it. Love it so, so, so much. It's, it's mostly because, you know, I adore the wonderful 101. And Platinum in general. And Hideki Kamiya and all of his works, even though I still probably should play Devil May Cry and Beautiful Joe, because they're like the only two that I haven't. And Resident Evil 2, but I'm not into horror games, so that one's kind of... that one's not happening. So there's only two that I would actively play that I should probably try at some point. But either way... I have to say, I love that they have all this kind of background information stuff here. It's the same reason why I love the journal echoes. It's because the kind of they add an element of world building to the experience. And you can look at them if you want, but you don't have to. And also, most of them aren't that long. I mean obviously there's the slight thing of it's gonna take you like maybe 40, 50 minutes to get through the entirety of the hierarchy, Lemmageddon's guidebook, the bosses. Oh, actually, it might be Infernal Demons. Actually, now that I think about it, it is Infernal Demons, not bosses. That's a different category and a different thing. So, it'll take you a while to read through all of it. But that's just reading through it in one massive chunk. And as you kind of could see with just peppering walk through with the journal echoes as we went along, even though like right at the start it was just like, oh my good god, this is a little bit much. Kind of, eventually they got a nice pace going and it didn't kind of seem overly long that we spent on them. So, kind of breaking this stuff up as you go along and you get entries in the hierarchy of Laguna whenever you meet a new angel. So you could look at them then if you liked. I just feel that it's more suitable for here, and I am shocked that they actually got away with a reference to the Book of Revelation, and then stating that it was written by a Lumen sage and found in the scriptures of Ithavol, because that's basically saying that Christianity in the Bayonetta universe is created by the Lumen sages, which is kind of approaching blasphemy, I think? in saying that the Bible's not written by the people who say they wrote it. Which kind of seems very, very potentially controversial for this game, but nobody's mentioned it because obviously nobody's really cared to look at all this kind of background information because people generally don't. It's mostly because people just like, play the game, okay, I'm done, moving on, and they don't look through all this background stuff, mostly because most people find it boring, but I like it. When it's in this particular form, when it's like Final Fantasy XIII codexy things, that's a little bit too much because you're there for hours trawling through ridiculously long things on a very tiny little screen because the size of the text is just minuscule, I hate it. But this is, this is okay, and this is kind of decent world building that is helpful, but doesn't... It's not required 
to understand the story, but it certainly helps kind of fill in details about angels that you may not have realised. Which is a really cool thing that I love. And I like how all of a sudden I've gotten incredibly positive about this game, even though I've been sort of a bit of a bitchy moan and whiny person. <laughs> I guess the fact that the end is in sight has sort of lifted my spirits somewhat. And also the fact that, you know, beat Infinite Climax, beat Rodan, got all of the bewitchments, because I'm a badass. Obviously there is the whole thing of I didn't beat Witch Trial 5, and there are the things that I've said that I've missed recording, but... I've covered practically everything. <laughs> so... I, I will be safe in that knowledge. That it'll all be okay, and... This is probably one of... the most comprehensive Bayonetta walkthroughs on the internet. It's not the most comprehensive, I'd say that honour's probably held by... Uh, I think there's, he's called Daedron, and then there's a couple of numbers, because uh, he's got some absolutely amazing Bayonetta 2 videos, and is a much better player than I am. And I think there are a few more, but I don't think anybody... I mean, I may be wrong, because I haven't watched that many Bayonetta 2 runs, but considering I know what people are like, I don't think anybody will have shown off the hierarchy of Laguna and Lemmageddon's guidebook and the Infernal Demons pages. Or at least not as part of a commentary type thing. Also, I am so remarkably embarrassed that for the longest time in the actual main body of the walkthrough I was calling the Affinities applauds. Just forgive me. Because I could remember the name of Applaud, and I couldn't remember Affinity, so I was just calling them Applauds when they were definitely Affinities. It's what happens when you have so many like enemy names. Thankfully they are, as I believe I may have said before, a lot easier to remember than the stuff in The Wonderful 101, because that was just weird mass of enemy names, because you had Gagujin, Walgagujin, Orochi, Dogu, Gedi Dogu, Chudagu, oh, let's see, can I get any more? No. Memory's not going to go that far. But I do remember a remarkable number of these enemies. I think it's because the, the names are a lot easier to remember. It's like Fortitudo, Fearless, Fairness, Grace, Glory. They're all kind of simple one-word things which can stick. And also, I guess, because having done walkthroughs of Bayonetta twice... Once in something that was definitely not HD, and was right back when I started doing commentaries. It was, like, maybe my fourth one or something. It, it's terrible. Absolutely awful. And then, when I got my hapage and could finally start recording in HD, I decided to uh, redo the walkthrough, because also I'd missed a number and resting place and to a journal entry, so it wasn't exactly a walkthrough the first time around. So I did it again in HD, and with my improved commentary style, because this was 2012, and I did the first one like 2010. It was very soon after its release. So two games of that and two games, well, two walkthroughs of very in-depth Bayonetta playing. Especially the second one which covered beating Rodan and all this background stuff. I guess I kind of 
got it ingrained into me. All the enemy names and all that, and it's kind of fed through into my run of Bayonetta 2, although certain things have kind of begun to slip through the cracks, like affinity. Well, considering that's like the most common enemy in the original Bayonetta, that's remarkably embarrassing. And I still can't quite believe that I did cock it up. But oh well. Something I should point out is that I'm pretty sure that the majority of the entries for these, like all of the enemies from the first game that reappear here are just copy-pasted from the entries in the original game. So there's not exactly anything new here, I don't think. Also, I think I may have just noticed a rather evil thing, yes. Well, and by evil I mean an Americanization. So when it was saying Sapientia's favour, they, they were using the Americanization, the Americanized form by dropping the U. Please, people, do not drop your U's, especially if you're kind of shipping out a PAL game. It's why Sonic Colors is better in y Europe and the UK, because, you know, that's actually how Colors is spelt. It has a U in it. And to be perfect, I should probably stop now, because I'm going to go on a massive rant about Americanizations of phrases and... Nobody wants to listen to that, because, <laughs> yeah, I could ramble for ages, and also this is the thing about Resplendence that I still can't quite play it. I think, I'm pretty sure it's kind of, it might be actually attached to worship, although I don't, no, it's not. I think it, it appears at the end of something, just, it's in chapter 14, I know that much, but Like, I don't remember facing it at all. At all. Like, I mean, I could probably... Well, no, I can't even spot it now, because, like, I've known about its existence, and, like, I've tried to locate it in the edited footage that I've got, and just... Nope. I'm absolutely blind to wherever it's come from. But, <laughs> oh well, it happens. And thankfully we are coming to the end of this first batch of reading for you. I hope you have been mightily informed by all of this wonderful information that is being provided to you by Hideki Kamiya and the people writing for this sort of stuff. And hopefully you will have enjoyed my rather inane ramblings over the top of this thing that I'm expecting you to read. Because... Reading in commentaries is a great idea. <laughs> especially, especially when it's a kind of pet hate of certain people. I'd like to think that the way that I've covered it in this particular run has been okay for people. And while well, I think in some, some circumstances I would read all of this, I've just got a little bit, a uh, little bit ready to be finished. So, <laughs> inane ramblings it is, because otherwise I think I might run out of breath in attempting to read all of this in the time that I gave myself. I mean, I think when I was recording I did go reasonably slow with reading, and because thankfully I was on my own in a room where most people can't hear me, at least I don't think they can, which would make me... If, well, if they did, I think I would freak out a little bit. But because nobody could hear me, I was just like, right, I will read this aloud and hopefully get a feel for the amount of time that I would need to read it were I to actually read it in commentary. Because that was one of the problems that I had in the actual main body of the walkthrough, is that I was reading those journal entries in my head. And... Generally, when you read in your head, you go a lot quicker than when you have to actually sound out the words that are on the page. Which sounds like a bit of a ridiculous thing, but it is true. Because when you're just reading 
in your head, your kind of brain just sees the words, it recognises it, and takes in its meaning. But when you have to actually speak, you have to look, take in the word, understand what it is, and then it's got to exit through your mouth, and it's just a much slower process. And I can't believe I ended up going on that type of tangent here. Either way... This whole thing with the True Vig the true Vigrid Chronicles Saavedra is very odd. And like, I was wondering what the heck it kind of meant. And to be honest, I'm not even sure if I do know what it means. Because it's a surname of quite a lot of people. And I don't know whether it's meant to be a reference to any of them. But... It's also actually a chess position. Which is kind of one of the best-known chess endgame things, named after the Spanish priest, Reverend Fernando Saavedra, who spotted a win in a position which was previously thought to have been a draw, which seems like a very odd thing to reference in Bayonetta. Like, it's a Really, really confusing thing. And... I don't think anybody knows what it is meant to be. Something we should probably ask Hideki Kamiya. Who is Saavedra? Because it's his... Well, at least, that is who has written this true chronicles of Vigrid, or true Vigrid chronicles, or what have you. Or at least, that's the pseudonym for it. And just, I don't know. Maybe it's something we'll find out in a kind of hypothetical, hopefully it will exist, Bayonetta 3. Because that, that would be a very, very interesting thing to go for. Like, very ridiculously interesting, because it's... Essentially, like, it's a footnote. In a kind of hidden away... It's not really hidden away, but kind of... Sort of... I'll use hidden away because it's the best thing I could think of right now, but hidden away little kind of... Article thing within the game that you wouldn't even pay attention to. It's very much the same as Aesir was in the original game. So I'm pretty sure Aesir gets mentioned in one of these small little things. And then kind of ends up becoming a big thing. And indeed, yes, um, he's referenced in the first Bayonetta regarding the explanations about the nature of the eyes, and Temperantia exclaims that Bayonetta holds the pride of an overseer, but that's about it. Anyway, we're done. Time to move on to Lemmageton's guidebook and the Infernal Demons. Let's see this.